Welcome back to Worldview. Now, the number of refugees who have fled South Sudan has crossed the 1.5 million mark, putting the country third after Syria and Afghanistan in terms of producing refugees, according to the UNHCR. The UN Refugee Agency now says unless rival governments and rebel forces agree to talk, the ongoing flow of refugees within the country and abroad will continue this year. And to put this in situation in perspective, KT News Akisa Wandra had a one-on-one -on -one interview with the former president of Botswana, Festus Mogai, who is a joint monitoring evaluation commissioner. Well, the situation in South Sudan is that we are continuing to struggle, we are continuing to implement the peace agreement. It's not moving as fast as we would have liked, but we are making some slow progress. But yes, we remain worried because um, violence is continuing all over the country. In the last three months, there was fighting in the north, Malakala and Rand, and there's um, also violence in the Victorias, I mean, Equatorias, uh, which hadn't, wasn't there before, but has emerged since, since the fighting in July. So a lot of negative things are happening, but basically related to violence. But otherwise, other aspects of the peace agreement we are trying to implement. But in the final analysis, um, it's, it's the violence that is worrying us. As you know, we, the government of national unity has been formed. The parliament has been reconstituted with uh, remaining a few uh, areas here and there. Uh, the NCAC, the National Constitutional Amendment uh, Committee, is now fully functional now that uh, at long last uh, chairman has been uh, agreed. Uh, we have functioned, this committee, which is very important, was uh, delayed because the chairman has to be provided by IGAD. The chairperson has to be provided by IGAD. And the first chairperson was a very able uh, law professor from here who was appointed, was, re, was not accepted by the government of South Sudan. And then it took time to find a replacement, when ultimately after about three months and a, a possible replacement was found, he in the end didn't accept the conditions. And therefore, it's only now that finally we, we, um, a suitably qualified uh, uh, chairman has been appointed and uh, acceptable. So he's now working full force, full steam in working at the, the constitutional aspects, including the prospective incorporation of provisions of the agreement into the transitional constitution. So those are aspects that, uh, that, that are happening. Reforms in the Ministry of Finance, for instance, uh, working with our advisors, uh, given the um, challenges that the, the budgetary situation is, is presenting to the government, it's, it's encouraging. It has been agreed, the government has agreed with the advice from our, our, our advisors that there is going to, going to be all, all revenues of the government should be paid on to the central bank. One single treasury account, which wasn't the case before. And then there is an the interministerial committee under the supervision of the Ministry of Finance, which determines on a cash basis how much goes there, how much goes where. That's financial accountability, very impressive one for the first time in the history of South Sudan. That's, that's a big advance. Violence. 
That's why I'm expressing dismay. We are making progress elsewhere, but progress either in containment or in, or in um, education or in health or, or in any of the, the, is the agreements, the institutions of the agreement. So long as there is no, so long as there is violence, it tends to vitiate all that progress. That is why one regrets it. So one moment I would be boasting that the Joint Military Ceasefire Commission is working, that the Joint Integrated Police now, they have been recruited, 1,200 police are waiting to be trained, which is good progress, because we are looking for uh, to law and order maintained by police. That's, 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 that's progress. But then if, if in the same, at the same time, violence is taking place all over the country, in the north, in the south, and the east, that's when I then get dismayed. Both leaders, Riek Machar and President Salva Kiir, have time and again gone against the peace deal that they signed. Do you think or do you feel like they are undermining the peace process that your commission is spearheading? Yes, I have said that the South Sudanese leaders, meaning led by those two, have appeared, have seemed to me always determined to defeat each other on the battlefield rather than accommodating each other politically and trying to work together. You know there is a joke in, in South Sudan that the, South, that the United States Army is 20 times the size of the South Sudanese Army, but the South Sudanese Army has twice as many generals. It's a joke. It might be a, a cynical joke. But it's not too far from the truth. For uh, one thing, for instance, there are so many guns in, in wrong hands in South Sudan. Someday, when peace will have come, it's going to be the priority of the government to try to reduce the number of guns in the hands of ordinary citizens, who therefore kill each other when they quarrel, whether it's about cattle or something. I mean, traditionally, I'm told there are practices of some of the communities raiding for cattle. But traditionally, they were doing so fighting with spears and, and uh, knob carries. But now, they are doing so with automatic rifles. It's frustrating everybody. Everybody other than the South Sudanese leaders themselves is frustrated. We see the, the potential of the country and the reasonableness of the what has been proposed to them, including the peace agreement itself. And then uh, they not abiding by, by, by it uh, is frustrating. Where exactly is Riek Machar? And if you have spoken to him, well, could you kindly let us in on some of those details as well as do you think his continued absence in South Sudan uh, has a great effect in the peace process? He is in South Africa, uh, we, we know that. I think he and I haven't communicated for over a month now, but uh, he knows my, my, uh, my telephone numbers. Uh, in the past, he did communicate when and if and when he wanted to. Oh, at that time he was challenging the agreement. He, he was asking what agreement am I implementing since the agreement between him and Salva has broken when there was uh, fighting between them. But the, the, uh, the agreement was not only between the two men. Even if both of them had died, that, the, the agreement would still be there because it was about they and their followers, the communities they led. It was not uh, ex exclusively in terms of individual. It's not like two private businessmen entering into, or you and I, I uh, agreeing to buy for me to buy a cow from you. Uh, so there were great, great many others. They, were, they entered into the agreement on behalf of the many communities they led. Human rights bodies have called for the establishment of hybrid courts to try and track the justice system for all the victims affected by the violence in South Sudan, but the Sudan government, the, other, the South Sudan government the other day said that they would rather concentrate on achieving peace first. 
do you think it's a high time we got this hybrid court that, of course, is to be established by the African Union? And it's up to the African Union as to when they establish it. But we are reaching a chapter where the Commission on Truth, Reconciliation and Healing and the, the Reparations Board have to, to be established, are in the process of being established. They fall under the same chapter as the, as the court. So it's up to the African Union as to whether they will remain behind so far as the hybrid court is concerned. Speaking about the African Union, the regional blocs, the African Union, IGAD as well, they have time and again participated in the peace process of South Sudan, but do you think they are doing enough? Yes, I think so. I mean, the peace agreement is visually, the South Sudanese, the South Sudanese um, on both sides, they accuse IGAD of having imposed the peace agreement on them. That itself is evidence that without the determined um, pressure by IGAD, there would have been no peace agreement and therefore no, no, no agreement to implement. I have stated previously that unfortunately the South Sudanese seem to continue to be determined to defeat each other militarily instead of accommodating each other politically. And that's why they sometimes say explicitly that the peace agreement was imposed on them. But it had to be imposed on them. How could they have been left to go killing each other the way they were, they were killing each other? And so, no, I, th I think IGAD has done a great deal. But unfortunately, yes, they, they have to continue to apply pressure on the South Sudanese uh, to make peace because they are destroying the country. You know, to date, there are 1.4 million South Sudanese in, in refugee camps in the region. 52,600 uh, people are, in January alone are said to have fled into Uganda. That's how dire the situation is. And um, deliveries of humanitarian Real, uh, food and are uh, obstructed, uh, obstructed by people in uniform carrying guns. As I say, well, I don't know whether I've said it right now, that in addition to the original government and opposition, new militias have emerged. Uh, other groups who, who were not there before are fighting, especially in Equatoria. Uh, there are militias there. Some of people they may be associated with one or other of the of the factions of the governmental factions, uh, IG and IO. Uh, others may be opportunistic, but also now it's in the logic of circumstance that given that there has been no regular food production or uh, economic activity in the country, uh, and, and hundreds of thousands are, are peop of people are dependent on humanitarian assistance. There are people now who will steal or kill because they, they had to eat. So that's how bad the situation is at present. But it, those, these latest developments are not surprising. I mean, emergence of criminality, in the absence of uh, law and order, in the absence of uh, security where people can produce food for themselves, you can, that can be expected. So do you get enough support from IGAD especially, given that all these regional governments have stake in the peace process of South Sudan? Yes, yes, I think they, I think they will. It could be better, it could be better, but uh, we are proceeding without uh, IGAD's involvement, we wouldn't be making any progress because the South Sudanese will resist. Even now, what they are doing is that they don't, they don't, uh, they don't say that they want to do things, but they are uh, showing passive resistance to many of the proposals we make.
including to some of the provisions of the agreement. They are not explicitly rejecting them, but they are not complying. If the South Sudanese were complying with the agreement, they wouldn't be fighting, and we would be making more progress. But as I say, there are many aspects of the, of the, of the um, agreement that are being implemented and have been implemented. But unfortunately, the fighting, the fighting tends to unravel. So what is the way forward? What is the commission planning to do? We, we have been doing everything all the time. We have, we have been everything all the time and talking with them, trying to persuade them that they should stop fighting and start talking to each other. That's what we have been doing. That's why we have made it, the progress that we have made. They put on, they keep on meeting, putting new conditions and we try to meet them. If it was not our efforts, uh, pursuant to the agreement of course, which was um, uh, created by, by IGAD, uh, there, there, there would be no